In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. First, I wanted to ask if you could, uh, if you could possibly let, if you could possibly let, uh, let people talk, because people over there are able to talk, and so you should let people talk. Assault! Assault! You are definitely assault. Assault is not okay. Well, uh, I have a right to stand here. This yeah. is my country. He so, has no right to put his hands on me. He put his hands on me. It's on video. So I wanted to, I wanted to address the crowd. My name is Ismail Warrior. I'm director of the Islam and Religious Freedom Section at the, at the Religious Freedom Institute. We're a multi-faith organization that exists to protect the religious freedom of everyone. So, that's terrible. I agree. So, we filed a brief in this case in order to support the family, a faith-based family. You should, you should talk to the police about it. I, I can't help you. I can't help you now. So we filed a brief in this case to support, to support the right of a faith-based Christian family to run its business as it wished. And we have to, as Americans, find a way to find some middle ground where we respect one another. So you're right. You used to be respected, but you should also respect the right of those, uh, of those who choose to run their businesses in the way that they see fit. And that's the American way. This is not the American way. The American way is to be allowed people to speak. And I think it's very obvious here which is the right side. It's very obvious here which side is respecting people's rights. And you have the right to say that, and I have the right to say that. What I'm saying are the families that run their businesses according to their religions, and churches, and mosques, and synagogues all have the right to run their organizations in the way that they wish to run them. And so I ask God to bring healing to this country and to stop the division. And I ask God to bring healing to your soul. And thank you for having me. Oh, my God. 
such examples of the division and power over others. conclusions that render heterosexuality and even the 
protective. Homophobe! Title VII's relevant protective characteristic is sex, which in 1964 and still today means biological sex. Plaintiffs are now demanding protection for gender identity and sexual orientation. Gender identity theory cements stereotypes into stone rather than eradicating them from law. It reduces what it means to be men and women to a collection of stereotypes that many people, especially women, have spent many years trying to overcome and that many people reject. The word sex is an objective term determined by reproductive anatomy. The Sixth Circuit was wrong when it precluded an interpretation of sex that reads sex to mean only an individual
the court, pray for our justices, and let's stand together, women unite, sex is not gender, stand up for the women of America, God bless you, and God bless the Supreme Court of the United States. Each of us wants continued legal security that we have worked so very hard for over these past decades. Like others, I have concerns of policy, law, science, concerning the definition of sex, but I am concerned with the conflation of sex and gender because I am the mother of a child on the autism spectrum, a community particularly vulnerable to misdiagnosis and exploitation. The CDC reports that one in 36 children suffer from autism spectrum disorder, and across studies, rates range from 5 to 54 percent among those with gender dysphoria, significantly higher than the general population. As of 2016, 23% Patients presenting to gender clinics have likely or very likely Asperger's syndrome. There is growing evidence that these children are not gender confused but are misdiagnosed. A 2017 study found an association between rapid onset gender dysphoria diagnosed in teen girls and having a friend or friends that identify as
Republicans most simply don't care about politics. They just want someone in power to listen and help protect their children from harm. Representing the Kelsey Coalition today are Elaine and Crystal. Give it up for Elaine. Like any parent, I was thrilled when I was told I had just delivered a healthy baby girl. Like any parent, I loved her as best I could, celebrated her gifts, and wanted to help her become a healthy whole of human being who recognized her strengths, weathering the tough times and triumph over the inevitable adversities that took us up, and I would be there by her side. Like any parent, I was shocked when my beautiful girl, who had never shown any signs of gender dysphoria, declared herself male after spending a lot of time on the internet chatting with various self-diagnosed trans kids. Like any parent, I could see that my happy, bright child is having trouble with navigating adolescence, a stage many kids have struggled through since the dawn of time. Like any parent, I was skeptical when mental health professionals seemed much more interested in informing the notion my daughter was born in her own body. Like any parent, I questioned the idea that this child I knew and loved, who was born absolutely perfect the way she was, who thrived until the teen years, was the wrong sex and required testosterone and surgery to make her body match her current self perception. Like any parent, I was shocked when my commitment and love for my daughter was called into question. Like any parent, I wondered why professionals would want to assist my daughter in becoming a lifelong medical patient. Mental health professionals didn't listen when I said my daughter has all the signs of being on the autism spectrum and said pushed her toward a path of drugs and surgery. Like any woman, I know what it's like to sometimes hate being female, especially given the sex stereotypes designed to hold us back. Like any woman, I can empathize with my daughter's desire to escape her body and other things that come with being a woman. Unwanted attention, being sexualized and harassed. And having others tell us how women are supposed to act and not supposed to act. Like any woman, I understood why any young woman would grapple with sexuality, whether lesbian, bi, or straight. Like any parent, I grieved as I saw my daughter slip away from me from the world. The more she was affirmed to something she wasn't. The more she got into character, the more angry and attacked she became. Like any parent, I felt betrayed. Productive organs removed and living in extreme poverty. All just to be her authentic self. Doctors did this to her, but she was still a minor without my consent or my involvement. My child is mentally ill, yet our public schools, government, mental health professionals, medical doctors, pharmaceutical companies are telling me what is best for my child. Like any parent, I am angry and full of rage that this is the only kind of help offered to my child. And that parental rights are being stripped away while doctors strip our children of their healthy reproductive organs. But most of all, my heart is shattered and I grieve for my child and the life she now faces, like any parent would. Now I would like to introduce you to another baby mother, Crystal, who is here to talk about what happened to her son hundreds if not thousands of other college students across the country. Young college students may legally be considered adults, but they have much growing up to do. Their brains are still developing, many are far away from home for the first time. They have the freedom and to make choices and hard decisions and are managing the stress of academics and finding new 
in France. And even though they are legal adults, they are not quite grown up. Neuroscientists agree that the prefrontal cortex, the decision making part of the brain, does not mature until the age of 25. And yet, college students are allowed to make life altering medical decisions that have the potential to damage their bodies beyond repair. And they ignore when they express, when we express our well founded concerns. I know this because this happened to my son. Did you know that most college students can be prescribed cross sex hormones while attending school unknown to their parents? I do because Rutgers University medically transitioned my son without my knowledge. Did you know that most college health care plans will pay for this? I do because my son received hormones with a minimal copay. Did you know that schools do not properly assess students before prescribing these drugs? I do because my son had all he had to do was sign a simple form and off to the pharmacy he went to pick up his prescription. These drugs are causing havoc to his body. Did you know that when you find out that your child's college is prescribing life form changing hormones and you try to tell them about it, they don't care. Rutgers transitioned my son even though I begged them to consider his underlying health concerns. It is standard medical practice that health history should be considered before prescribing any drug.
be here. I lived a transgender life for eight years. It all started when I was four years old, and my grandmother started cross-dressing me, and I enjoyed it very much. But that cross-dressing started a confusion within me about who I was. And it was in 1944, before we had any words like gender dysphoria, I was just a confused kid that was being affirmed by my grandmother, who actually caused me to have this tremendous confusion, which started this journey to transgenderism. And later in life, after struggling with this for almost 38 years, I went to a gender specialist who told me I needed reassignment surgery and hormone therapy. And it sounded reasonable to me. So I went ahead and started on hormone therapy and had gender reassignment surgery in 1983 and became Laura Jensen, or identified as Laura Jensen female for eight years. I worked for the federal government. I had good jobs. And I eventually started going to school. I wanted to be a therapist. So I studied at UC Santa Cruz and realized that in studying the books and the stacks, that people who identified with gender identity disorder had mental disorders. They had things like body dysmorphia. They had bipolar disorder, dissociative disorder, schizophrenia. And I thought, we're not approaching this from the right direction. We need to be addressing the comorbid problems that are causing people to believe they're a different gender. It seems to be compassionate to me to reach out to those people and actually guide them in the right direction and not fill their bodies with hormones and cut body parts off and rearrange everything in their life so that their lives are totally destroyed. And so I have been, my website, sexchangeregret.com, in 2015, over 350,000 people came to that website to explore what I was talking about. Today we have a worldwide ministry that reaches over 300 million people a year. And people now are detransitioning in the hundreds. People, people are transgender until they're not transgender anymore. And they come back to realize that they never needed hormones, they never needed surgery, they just needed to identify what was causing them to behave the way they were behaving. I have tremendous compassion for those people who are struggling deeply with their identity, and we all need to love them and have compassion for them, but compassion isn't filling them with hormones, it's not cutting off their body parts, it's addressing the issues that are causing them to feel that way. Let's rise up and help the people who need it.
a way that would protect my privacy and dignity, but they didn't. Instead, they told me that this was the new normal. Instead of listening, they made me feel as though I was the problem for feeling uncomfortable and vulnerable with a boy in my bathroom. They changed the rules without telling us or our parents. They didn't care what we thought. This was our first time I felt overlooked or unheard. This was the first time I felt like my life was spinning out of control. When I was little, my sister and I had spent years in the foster care system. I felt lost, hopeless, and nameless without a place to call my home. But when my parents adopted me, they gave me a new home. They failed to look out for me and other girls just like me. I know what red discrimination feels like. I've experienced it, and I don't want anyone else to have to go through what I've gone through. But there are good ways to make room for everyone without letting a boy into the girls' locker room, restrooms, and shower areas. Today's court case is about whether the government can rewrite the rules in a way that will require employers and encourage public schools to take away privacy spaces for women like me. I'm asking the Supreme Court not to do that. I'm asking the Supreme Court to respect women just like me. I'm speaking up because women and girls deserve a space where we can change clothes or take a shower without men or women into our locker rooms, our restrooms, and our shower areas. I'm speaking up for young girls. to confusion about their identity. We've got to stand against this. Dr. Josephson, Dr. Alan Josephson, is with us today. He served as professor in chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He's the lead author of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's practice parameters on the assessment of the family. He is an award-winning uh, researcher, doctor, psychiatrist, He's recognized nationally and internationally for his work in religion, spirituality, and psychiatry. And we're glad that he's here today to tell us the story. Numerous accolades from our patients, families, students, and those from throughout the country. In the fall of 2017, I took part in the Heritage Foundation panel here in Washington, D.C. One of the questions asked me is what is the best way to treat children with gender dysphoria? Many of these kids have serious distress, anxiety, depression, and they ask me what's the best way to treat them. As a physician who cares about my patients, my answer is straightforward. The best treatment is always based on the understanding of what is causing the child's distress. What does the confusion stem from? Is it a physical problem or is it an emotional problem? As a behavioral scientist, I could not bring myself to say this is just something that happens. We do not approach any other medical condition that way, and we didn't need to approach this one that way. We need to understand a condition before we can treat it for it. The scientific method, and any scientific method says you ask questions whether you're both in the study or see a patient. One of the first questions when these children present is why? Why is this patient having difficulties? And that question applies to children with gender dysphoria just as it applies to a middle aged man or woman who has chest pain. That's all I said. But I soon found out that why is not a question that doctors can ask these days. At least when it comes to gender dysphoria. And the 
I have heard stories of this happening to other girls in other states. I knew about the girls in Connecticut who lost 15 state track and field titles to two boys over the past two years. A track official told them that girls had the right to participate, but not the right to win. I also heard about boys competing against girls teams in soccer, volleyball, and wrestling and sharing our locker rooms and shorts. There's a reason why schools have separate teams for boys and girls, and it's not just about physical advantage. And it's even more dangerous in physical contact sports. I'm already worried about looking up and seeing a young man looming over me on the soccer field. And that's why I was so proud of Selena Soul and Alana Smith, two of the track athletes in Connecticut, when they bravely spoke out in defense of themselves and all other girls by bringing their situation to the U.S. Department of Education and Housing. but not the right to win. If adults force girls to compete against girls, they often mean they'll be competing for something else, using the opportunity to win championships and earn college scholarships. That's hardly the equal playing field because of the opposite And that's why I'm here to speak with you today on the court process. I would much rather be at home playing soccer or taking batting practice. Being a girl doesn't come with limitations, and adults shouldn't create them. Thank you. with them. If we don't have people stand up like Grace and, the next, and our next speakers, uh, Selena Soul's mother is here today. We're going to be, our daughters and our future for women's athletics is, is really at risk. Here today again is Selena Soul's mother, Bianca Stanescu, um, and she's going to be talking about uh, the experience that her daughters had in a long She's also the mother of a lead high school trap athlete and an advocate for women's sports here from Connecticut as well. Thank you all for coming out here today. We've been watching in this belief as girls are being kept off the winner's podium because of boys who identify as girls. My name is Bianca Stanescu. I am the mother of the elite track and field athlete in Connecticut. My daughter is one of the best in the state, but her athletic future is at risk now because the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference now allows boys who identify as girls to compete in women's sports based on gender identity rather than biological sex. Biology is what matters in athletics, not a person's gender identity. Women's sports were created to give girls a fair chance at competition. That includes fair victories and fair defeats. Girls deserve the same opportunity as boys to excel, to advance to the next level of competition, to win, and to stand on that podium. By allowing boys to compete in girls' sports, shatters dreams, and denies our daughters' opportunities. Boys will always have a physical advantage over women. That's why we've been having women's sports as a separate category. Bodies, boys' bodies are simply different. They are bigger, they are stronger, they are faster. Science and common sense tells us that. And so do the times at the track events. In our states, as well as many others, And this can happen at any time. For sports, that means that even a mediocre boy can suddenly switch 
to identify as a girl and completely dominate women's sports. It only takes a handful of boys to compete in girls' sports to be eliminated and kept from advancing at the next level of competition. My daughter would have qualified and advanced in the 55 meter dash event last spring. But instead, top two spots went to biological boys identifying as girls. She lost her chance to compete in the finals and to advance the New England Championship. My daughter became a spectator in her own sport. She had to watch from the stands as others competed in her event instead of being in it herself. Boys are robbing girls of the chance to win, crushing their dreams and competing at the next higher level. Our efforts must focus on starting and maintaining a dialogue about these issues. Status quo is not an option. We need to explore other options and find a solution where young women are not denied their place in a fair competition. And on that podium, there are too many parents, coaches, authority figures remaining silent. Young women like my daughter have been punished, bullied, called sore loser or transphobic in the media just for saying that their opportunity to compete on a fair playing field is being taken away from them. Some school districts even forbid the coaches to talk about this. Imagine your girl who is denied a victory working day and night just to shave mere fractions of a second of her time is denied a win, recognition, or even a scholarship. All because she has to compete against physically superior boys who decide to identify differently than what they are biologically. Imagine your child is being punished just for raising these questions. Will you stay silent then? I hope you will not. Speak up now. We must stop this hostile takeover of women's rights. Changed. 
futures. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Next, we have Virginia Cobb, who's with the uh, Virginia Family Foundation. Thank you. We've been here before when the court has decided to redefine words, to write law, and to override the majority will of states all across our country. Today, again, we stand here outside the U.S. Supreme Court waiting to see if the court's going to again rewrite a timeless definition of the word sex and overwrite the will of the majority of states. Sex has always referred not to a set of stereotypes in one's mind about how whether one feels like a woman. Sex has always referred to the physiological and hormonal things that come with having XX chromosomes. That is the definition of sex. My sex is female not because I feel like putting on a dress and jewelry and because I don't like monster trucks. I am a female because I was given by God XX chromosomes. Brief submitted in this case, put state and local and federal legislative bodies, rather than the judiciary, are best able to articulate precisely what they want protected. So long as this court does not leave oral arguments today and imprecisely impose some vague definition on this nation, states will retain the freedom to make these determinations as they see fit. States will retain the ability, for example, to distinguish between those who have had surgery sex changes and those who have not, a particularly relevant thing when it comes to athletics. A state might determine that in matters of bodily privacy and safety, it simply can't risk the safety of a vulnerable population. Even in Anchorage, they've settled a lawsuit rather than continuing to force a domestic violence shelter to allow biological men, knowing that to do so fails to protect those very women that they have set out to protect. This court is not authorized in our Constitution to legislate, nor is it well suited to draft a law around the nuances of this issue. In Virginia, our General Assembly has rejected the idea of, of doing non-discrimination by gender identity, specifically because it understands that it would be difficult to anticipate and fully account for the vast sweeping impact of a vague gender identity non-discrimination policy. A recent quote I read simply said this about how many genders there are. It said, there's only one good answer to the question of how many genders there are. Gender is a spectrum and there are as many gender definitions as there needs to be for every person to have a label that feels true to themselves. That is difficult for a state to understand the impact of, but it is impossible for the U.S. Supreme Court to legislate that on all of our states. Our state has already seen the ramifications when a locality jumps beyond our state law and decides to impose a generic gender non-discrimination policy. It results in victims, victims like my friend Peter Fleming, who has now been a teacher fired from his job because his West Point County has decided that in order for them to have a non-discrimination policy, it means compelled speech for their freedom, for their teachers, and it means termination when one does not comply. Virginia has already felt the impact, and Peter Vlaming has already lost his job, already lost his career, and lost his livelihood. I have no doubt we'll be back here to defend his freedoms if this court does not continue to uphold one's right to understand traditionally defined words like sex. Today's case is poised to have impact on businesses and schools and you name it all across this country. As expansive as that decision would be, it could reach into churches, it could reach into ministries. If this decision has the power to impact many, many people. If this court decides to redefine the term sex discrimination in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to include gender identity, the impact cannot be understated. Finally, this court has an opportunity to make clear that individuals, businesses, and charities should not be punished simply because they hold traditional views or traditional definitions of words that have been since the beginning.
beginning of time. This one has the opportunity to make it clear that no one should lose their livelihood because of what they believe. That's why we're standing here today with Alliance Defending Freedom, standing here together and standing for reality. Thank you. the Christian Medical Association. He represents health professionals across this nation who are standing against medical practices that cause life-altering, irreversible harm to children and youth, struggling with their identity. Thank you, John. Thank you. So our doctors love treating LGBT patients. They love and care for all patients. They just need to rely on biology in order to treat patients well. But some people think that to show compassion and respect for transgender individuals, the government has to force everyone to ignore not only the clear evidence of biology, but also the clear meaning of the law. That's why a few ideological members of the EEOC and activist judges have rejected the plain meaning of sex discrimination that Congress, women, and doctors have all understood and relied upon for decades. In the process, these activists are threatening to undermine the very protections against sex discrimination that Congress enacted, which have transformed opportunities for women. So this case today is as much about the law and individual freedom as it is about gender. I did not because I'm not. We will have no individual freedom in this country if the government can require you to believe whatever the government wants you to believe. The genius of our nation's constitutional protection of individual rights and freedom is not only that the minority is protected from the tyranny of the majority, but also that the majority is protected from the tyranny of the minority. The goal of our democratic republic is protecting the greatest freedom for each one of us, protecting us from government coercion, whether our views align with the majority or with the minority. So let's all work together to protect each other's freedom, to choose our beliefs, and to act in accordance with those beliefs you know I mean? without like government coercion. Thank you. If the political left can't fix this problem, can the political right? And the best answer that I heard given to that question was, it's not going to be the left or the right that's going to fix this problem. It will be women. Working and fighting together. In that spirit, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Meg Kilgannon, my friend and colleague and Hands Across the Aisle Women in Coalition. Let's give it up for Hands Across the Aisle. like myself, women on the political right, like Meg, have come together in coalition to fight for the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. Meg Kilgannon is a member of Hands Across the Aisle Women in Coalition and the founder of Concerned Parents and Educators of Fairfax County, Virginia. Give it up for my friend Meg. Good morning. In 2015, our school board in Northern Virginia added gender identity to the non-discrimination clause that governed our schools. They did this outside the bounds of law, proper governance, and common sense. It became obvious that ordinary women like me, ordinary families like yours, ordinary citizens with ordinary lives would have to stand up and fight back against the rich and powerful interests who want to use vulnerable children to legitimize their particular brand of sexual politics. School-based policies that call for affirmation of gender identity are dangerous to children, families, and all of society. These policies are dangerous because they ignore a simple truth, that every child is born in exactly the right body. Affirmation policies harm not only the parents and children who object to having opposite sex students and teachers in their private spaces. These policies harm the very families they are supposed to help by perpetuating the 
myth, the lie that gender is real. Too many schools are going along with the lie that sex can be changed from male to female or female to male. It is a crime against humanity to put children on the path to castration, mastectomy, and hysterectomy in the service of this lie. resources and manpower but just because a lie is well funded and just because a lie is told over and over and over again that does not make it true it does not make it okay for children or any less of a threat to families and human dignity because we know the truth every child is born in exactly the right body our opponents have lots of money they have the cooperation of academia popular culture and mainstream corporate media but they are still liars liars who use children to fight to legitimize their lies i want to thank the organizers of this event and i want to thank defendants in this case for refusing to back down. The fact that this case is going on is further evidence of the lengths to which some people must go to defend a lie that has no defense. Thank you. I also just want to say that even though Meg and I live probably not more than five miles from each other, we never would have met each other had it not been for our shared commitment to the right to privacy and safety of women and girls. Sex, not gender. 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 In 2014, a man named Fallon Fox, who quote unquote identifies as transgender, was permitted to compete in a fighting competition with Tamika Brents. Fox gave Brents a concussion and broke her skull and effectively ended Tamika's career. Afterwards, Tamika had this to say, I have fought a lot of women and have never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. I can't answer whether it's because he was born a man or not because I'm not a doctor. I can only say I have never felt so overpowered in my life. Do you think it is fair for males to participate in women's sports? for males to participate in women's sports. No! Our next speakers are Beth Steltzer, an amateur power lifter and founder of Save Women's Sports, Inga Thompson. She's an Olympic cyclist and founder of the Inga Thompson Foundation, an organization that works to ensure women have the same opportunities to succeed in competitive cycling as do men. And Linda Blade. Linda Blade comes to us from Alberta, Canada, where she is president of Athletics Alberta, a coach and a former heptathlete. She works hard to maintain sex-segregated sports in the province of Alberta. She's come all the way from Alberta to be with us to fight for the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls in the U.S. Please welcome these three brave women. as a female organized a disruptive protest and demanded that we share the platform with them. These gender extremists are insisting that we accept their feelings as science, yet they do not consider the feelings of others. Choosing your competition or what sex you are is not a human right. Sex separated spaces are essential for the safety and fairness of females. Conflating gender identity with sex undermines all that Title VII and Title IX represent. I am an average American citizen telling you it is time to speak the truth. Defending biology is not bigotry. It is not hate speech to defend your rights. If we allow biological males to compete in women's sports, there will be men's sports, there will be co-ed sports, but there will no longer be women's sports. 
What will you be telling future generations you did to save women's rights during this transgender trend? Have you defended girls' rights to set boundaries for their bodies or compete fairly in sports? It should not rest on their shoulders. Together, we can preserve the definition of sex. Do not allow this transgender delusion to silence you. I encourage you all today to stand behind Harris Funeral Homes and stand up for women. Hello, my name is Inga Thompson, and I'm a three-time Olympian in cycling for, um, for women's sports. I am an advocate for the biological women in sports, and I'm an also an advocate for the transgender women in sports. I feel the International Olympic Committee has dropped the ball yet once again with women in sports. They have dropped the ball with the development of transgender athletes in sports. After many struggles, we now have Olympics for women. Special Olympics and Paralympics. I believe it is time for the International Olympic Committee to begin the quest for transgenders who have their own Olympics. Many transgender athletes would love to compete, but feel their wins would be diminished by racing against biological women. They understand that biological males competing against biological females is not fair. You are excluding these great transgender athletes from being able to compete because the IOC has dropped the ball on the true representation of all athletes. International Olympic Committee, please don't punt on the future of young girls and our transgender athletes. Please protect all athletes. Thank you. Hello. I came in from Canada yesterday. I am an alumnus of the University of Maryland, just down the road. It feels like a homecoming. I want to say thank you, USA, for Title IX and for giving me that, that opportunity. But you know what? We are not going to have those opportunities anymore if this, if we do not keep sex as biology. Yes. Right? So right now, in my current position, I am the president of Athletics Alberta, the, the state or the province, Track and Field Association. I'm also a 30-year coach in track and field by now. And I'll tell you, there's three things that are going to be problems. Girls and women getting their medals and placings and positions taken away by male athletes in their events, on their fields, on the tracks, and the gyms. That's the one thing. Second thing is, we're going to have their, the, the male bodies in female locker rooms. We cannot have that because it's going to push the girls out. And finally, one thing that people forget, if our official, our officials, our competition officials are charged with hate speech for simply asking whether somebody's in the right category, we will have no competition officials. And if we have no officials, we'll have no sports. Now, this ideology is basically people sitting on the branch called woman and they're sawing that branch off. It's not helping anybody, right? And it strikes me as very ironic that we're one year away, one year away from the 100 year anniversary of suffrage and I, I'm sure the suffragettes would be appalled to find out that in 2019 and 2020, the word woman now is whatever a man says it is. That can't be right. So we have to make sure and we plead with our legislators and our justices, everybody please, sex is, bio sex is biology. Sex is biology. We have to keep it like that. Otherwise, it'll be chaos. All right, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for standing up for women and girls. I'm Natasha Chart, and I'm the board chair of the Women's Liberation Front. Thank you all so much for coming today. I, I've been told that I am not a nice and inclusive person for saying that the law needs to be able to recognize sex. And not just me, but all the women who don't believe that human beings can change sex. We've, been, we've even been accused of perpetuating genocide. It's funny.
funny because five years ago I first started seeing lesbians were being publicly shamed, sexually harassed, and demonized by straight men calling themselves lesbians. These men also tended to call themselves progressives, feminists, and they keep telling us, they were telling us then and they keep telling us now that they are absolutely indispensable to the women's movement and we cannot do without them. Everyone can always see this behavior and they always get away with it. I didn't think and I still feel that sexually harassing lesbians is a good way to be inclusive. So I objected. It turns out it's a firing offense on today's left to complain about men sexually harassing lesbians if that man says he feels like he's a lesbian. That harassment still goes on and if anything, it has gotten worse. Women share shocking screenshots with me from lesbian dating apps, which are now just simply packed wall to wall with men. These men have even started getting women's profiles suspended for saying no to them and refusing to recognize their gender and validate their feelings. Across social media, women's accounts and access to public conversation is under permanent, constant surveillance for offenses against men claiming to be women with catastrophic penalties for refusing to lie for them to spare their feelings. Is that nice behavior? What about my feelings? What about the feelings of all the women who have lost all access to public conversation on social media? I saw that President Obama made several moves to end single-sex facilities for women and girls through executive branch orders and funding threats. His administration and now the entire Democratic Congressional Caucus made a point of insisting on an end to women's rights to bodily privacy for men whenever we are outside our homes. If a woman complains that a man has dropped his trousers in front of her as a, at a job, the left will shout, me too, in solidarity, and he'll be canceled. If a woman complains because he drops his trousers in front of her in a gym locker, but he says he's a woman, they'll cancel her. Is that kind? Was it inclusive when the women who objected to that were fired for it? Women are still being fired if they dare to say anything against this. Anywhere on the left, some of us may be fired for the offense of appearing at this gathering today. None of the women at liberal organizations can say no to this agenda or their peers will destroy them. And that makes their consent to this, their support for it, as meaningful as a hostage statement. A woman wrote to me, a progressive reporter who is outspoken and not shy to hold unpopular opinions to ask for a quote for this case. And after she got my reply, she said to me, she wrote, I just met Amy as she prepares for tomorrow. She is a woman. And I asked her, in what way is Stevens a woman? And she said, and I quote, it's not a matter of what I think. And I'm here for her too today, even though she probably really dislikes me. It is the right of all women to speak publicly and to be able to petition our government for the redress of our grievances and to be able to participate openly in the public sphere. I have seen numerous women banned from social media for pointing out that gender transition treatments leave children sterile for life at ages where they can't possibly consent to such permanent decisions. But a generation of quirky, stereotype-rejecting kids, many of whom would grow up to identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, many of whom are autistic, are being sterilized as minors now. And the only crime that the left or social media companies seem to recognize in this is the crime of women objecting to the wholesale sterilization of vulnerable children. For that, we get accused of promoting genocide. There are doctors in the U.S. who will go to work today and oversee the chemical castration of little boys who will put 14-year-old girls into menopause 
I have trouble with young girls, cosmetic mastectomies. And I object, and for that I'm considered dangerous. I've seen public calls for every type of harm against those of us who object to the end of women's sex-based rights, or who object sterilization of children. To the people who say this, the only meaningful type of violence is that I refuse to call a man she. Still others insist that it's violent of me to associate with conservatives, in spite of the, gen the fact that gender activists associate with lots of conservatives. And I have never seen anyone have a problem with that. It's almost like women who say no to these men are just going to be wrong no matter what we do. Sisters, when a man puts you under constant surveillance and retaliates whenever you say no and huffs about being indispensable and he makes you whine to spare his feelings and he always puts you in the wrong no matter what, that is not a partnership, it's abuse. Plan a way out before it gets worse, it will get worse. In closing, to echo my sisters in the UK, a man can never be a woman. A lesbian can never be male. My name is Natasha Chart from New York State. I will not be forced to lie. I will not submit. I just want to thank the women from the Women's Liberation Front for being here to lead the way today. God bless you. It's really hard to stand up against people who call you names, the people that bully you. It's, it's hard, right? But we have a right to speak. We can't be bullied into silence. I'm Penny Nance. I'm the CEO and President of Concerned Women for America. judicial decrees? Will they punish a business for not implementing policies that did not exist before? It would be a historic act of hubris and a great injustice for them to do that. One that has enormous consequences for us, for women. Women like Selena Saul, who you heard from, Alexis Lightcap and Beth Stouffler, who you heard from today, millions more like them who just won protected spaces in a level playing field. That's what we want. Such a monumental shift in policy would impact our laws in many areas. We're already seeing cases from women's athletics to women's shelters and prisons, health care, women's safety and privacy. I would add that vulnerable women, those who are incarcerated or in women's shelters would be disproportionately harmed and have the most to lose. To arbitrarily change the word sex to include gender identity is regressive, not progressive. It would greatly undermine the women's movement and the women who dedicated their lives to the rights for women. We gather here today out of compassion and the belief that being a woman is unique and valuable. Our human experience cannot be replicated by clothing or even by surgery. Being a woman is a beautiful biological and spiritual reality that transcends human will. Our dignity and safety demands that the courts reject the notion that sex is superfluous. I have the privilege to serve as a member of the Women's Suffragist Centennial Commission, where we're working hard to commemorate 100 years of the women's right to vote. And it's worth noting that the word sex 
is in the 19th Amendment. We know what it means. We know what it meant for 100 years. Finally, we have examples throughout all of time and from all over the world in which women have suffered because they have not been given the respect and honor due their sex. We're here to stand up for women and young girls, and we're here to say sex means sex. Thank you. Thank you for coming out today. God bless you. Well, we are privileged now to have those who have been inside this courtroom outside with us. And first to speak today with us to, to talk more about what they've just experienced and about this case are Tom and Nancy Ross, who are the owners of Harris Funeral Home. My name is Tom Ross, owner of RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes. Americans and American businesses should be able to rely on what the law says. We're hopeful the Supreme Court will uphold that basic right for everyone. Our business exists to serve grieving families. There is no time in life more difficult than after losing a loved one. For more than 100 years, my family has had the honor of coming alongside those walking that difficult road helping thousands of families in the Detroit area begin the journey towards healing. Now my family's livelihood and our legacy hang in the balance before the Supreme Court. And what the court decides will impact people across the country. Our company has a professional code of conduct and sex-specific dress code to ensure that families can focus on processing their grief. In 2007, we hired a male funeral director who agreed to follow those policies. Nearly six years later, the employee gave me a letter expressing an intent to violate the dress code by dressing and presenting as a woman when working with grieving families. I felt deep concern for the employee. I care about all the people that work for me. They're part of my family. That's why I intervened to save the employee's job a few months earlier. I spent a couple of weeks thinking over what the employee's proposal meant for everyone involved, including my other employees and clients. Funeral directors are the face of a funeral home. They are often the first people you meet after a loved one has died. We created the dress code decades ago for the benefit of the families with whom we interact at such an emotional time. After much thought, I determined we could not go along with the employee's proposal. It was a difficult choice, but I felt it was in the best interest of the grieving families our business served. Even though I acted in accord with federal law in creating and applying my dress code, the government sued us. And although the government has now changed course and agrees that we didn't violate the law, the ACLU continues its effort to punish us. The ACLU is trying to use my grandfather's business as a pawn to achieve a larger political goal that it has been unable to achieve in Congress where this issue belongs. In the past century, our family's business has survived two world wars, the Great Depression, and a decade-long economic downturn in the city we call home. Through it all, we've been committed to serving our neighbors. But now we face a severe penalties because the ACLU is trying to change the law out from under us. Yeah! We're hopeful that the Supreme Court won't impose such unjust punishment on us. All of us should be able to rely on what the law says. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.